Computer Chronicles is brought to you by rondiamond.com, the oldies site on the internet. Music and memories from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, not just another jukebox. Additional support comes from the law offices of Ivan Hoffman, lawyering with integrity for internet law, copyright, trademark, and other intellectual property law. And by TechWeb for up-to-the-minute technology news. Hi, and welcome to this special edition of the Computer Chronicles. We're in Dayton, Ohio this week, in the snow, visiting one of the country's biggest old-fashioned computer fairs. It's called Computer Fest, and it's put on twice each year here by one of the country's most active users groups, the Dayton Microcomputer Association. All volunteers, vendors... The DMA put on their first Computer Fest nearly 25 years ago, back in 1976, and it's been growing ever since. They were the days when users groups were essential to understanding the new PC revolution. But despite the growing sophistication in personal computer technology these days, the DMA believes there is still a need for users groups. Well, today's world, you, you, you find that a user group is still necessary due to the fact that uh, the computer stores out there, the large stores, don't have time, they don't have the manpower, they can't afford anymore to have that communication with the customer. They're there to make the sale. It's a hard market out there that they deal with, and they're there to make the sale. Uh, and that's kind of sad, but it's good for the user group, because that, that means that those people have to go somewhere for that information, for that training, they come here to us. What's unusual about this computer show is that it's a nonprofit endeavor. Other shows, sales shows, are a little different. They're, they're run by commercial organizations. They're for profit. Uh, of course, there is some profit that we receive here, that DMA receives, but our profit, we don't keep. It goes back into the community through uh, other activities and projects that we sponsor. What is truly amazing is that this entire show is put on by volunteers, with attendance often rising to 30,000 and some 200 exhibitors to deal with, it's a big task for an unpaid staff. We're a completely volunteer organization. We have no paid help here. We use well over 600 uh, volunteer hours for the we this weekend alone. And that doesn't count all the days and hours and months that we use throughout the year because it actually, we, start, we started working last week on the show for a year from now. Computer Fest thrives here in the Midwest and in Dayton in particular because this community is unusual in its passion for technology. It is the only city in the country that supports a daily live local radio talk show devoted to personal computers. The show is hosted by Brad Proctor and Douglas Heil. Their in-studio guest today was some guy who hosts a computer TV show. With computers still a challenge for many users, there is no shortage of callers with questions about their PCs. A lot of it's the common day things, uh, you know, how to fix this or how to fix that. Uh, modems have always been a big, it's the, almost we have the obligatory modem question every time we open up the phone lines. Uh, but it's, you know, today it's more CD-ROM burners. We're putting new technology or DVDs or how do I get my video. Douglas just absolutely uh, excels at that kind of information. Uh, uh, I mean, he's the wizard for, for uh, hooking up all multimedia. The Dayton community also runs one of the nation's leading computer recycling programs. Their volunteers check out the old machines, clean off the hard drives, install a new operating system, and then turn them over to people who can't afford to buy a computer. The program is called the Ohio Technology Access Project. And this is a program whereby we recycle donated computers, uh, refurbish them. Uh, we have a, a, a kernel set of software that we apply to the machines. And then we, then we uh, distribute them to uh, people who qualified. Uh, could be churches, uh, could be uh, small schools, but mostly disabled persons. While most people come to Computer Fest to get good deals on computer stuff, there is also a full program of seminars covering topics ranging from certification programs to digital photography. One popular seminar here was put on by Microsoft demonstrating the new Windows 2000. If you haven't seen Win 2000 before, it does have some very cool new features. One of the best is the new self-healing capability. Even if you accidentally delete a key system file, Windows 2000 will recognize that and fix itself, 
automatically reinstalling the file that you deleted. Win2000 has added some features from Internet Explorer and the Office Suite to the new operating system, including intelligent menus, a more robust notepad program, and a printer utility resident in the word processor, so you don't have to exit to the control panel to add a new printer. For laptop users, Win2000 also adds power management features not previously available with NT. One of the limitations for laptop users in the previous operating system was the inability to utilize power management features to conserve battery life. And we've built that right now into the operating system so laptop users will be able to manage their battery life and get more out of their battery. And that's great for people on the go and on the mobile user. Windows 2000 also has new security features that were not available before in Windows 98. But perhaps the best part of Windows 2000 for the individual user is that it comes bundled with a new game, finally. Now, in addition to Solitaire, Free Cell, and Minesweeper, you get 3D Pinball, which happens to take advantage of another Win 2000 feature, DirectX 7. Many computer users have been trying to figure out whether or not it is worth upgrading to Windows 2000, and Microsoft's David Severino says it depends. The key message here is Windows 2000 was built for the business user. However, we do recommend it for people that we call super users or computer enthusiasts, the people that really like to be on the cutting edge with the current technology. And those would kind of be people that we would recommend as consumers at home that might be interested in using Windows 2000 as their consumer-based operating system. While there was lots of interest in Windows 2000, the hot ticket here at Computer Fest was the series of Linux seminars. Linux was everywhere. Don Corbett was one of the Linux speakers, and he says there's good reason for the growing interest in the Linux platform. The stability of the operating system itself, uh, the product's been around for nine years. The kernels are very thoroughly tested. They're written and tested by people with good engineering backgrounds. Uh, it, it's a product that not just one person designs or one company designs. It's really a worldwide shared product. So because of that, uh, the companies that package for the interoperability like Red Hat, Caldera, SUSE, they have tested their program so that everything works well together. So when you load this on your system, it's going to be solid. You're not going to lock up. It, it, it's a proven effective product. Of course, one big question was, where are the Linux-based applications? And they were here. Of course, Netscape is available as a Linux browser, but there are also now other applications coming online. This program, for example, called GIMP, is a Photoshop-type program for doing digital image processing. There are several other nice features of Linux. One is that you can do more than multitask. You can actually keep several separate desktop environments going at the same time, each one doing a totally different task. And for mainstream business work, Sun now offers a free download of Star Office. It's a complete Linux-based business suite, including word processor, spreadsheet, graphics program, presentation program, and more. Also, the new versions of Linux, like Red Hat 6.1, bridge the gap between the older Unix look and the newer GUI approach. If you haven't seen Linux or Unix, really, in the last year, you haven't seen it because the GUI interfaces are just amazing. They're, they're really, really different. Uh, they're, they're, they, act like, they act like what people expect from Windows. One of the big advantages of Linux is cost. The software is basically free, as are many of the Linux applications. The real advantage of Linux is the total cost of ownership. Uh, for $29, you have a system that provides you with a full graphic user interface, word processing, spreadsheets, time tracking. It's all included. And what you're really paying for for the $29 is documentation and support help. The software is really free. And if you're looking for a complete web server package, Linux is even a bigger bargain. On the server side, you know, a lot of people spend $30,000 uh, on high-end Unix servers or even NT servers. You've got your licensing costs for those and then seats and workstations. Uh, for $179, uh, you, you can buy the Red Hat Professional, which includes like the Apache server, and uh, it's a full-blown, ready-to-go, internet-ready system.
You might not think of Dayton, Ohio as a center for technology innovation, but you would be wrong. They say here there are more patents per capita in Dayton than in any other city in the United States. In fact, about 100 years ago in this building right here, one of the country's most famous inventors, Charles Kettering, developed the world's first electric starter and ignition system for the automobile. He used that to start a little auto parts company called Delco. That's an acronym for Dayton Engineering Laboratories Company. Charles Kettering is one of three high-tech icons in the Dayton area. The others are the Wright brothers and John Patterson, the founder of NCR. NCR has its world headquarters here in Dayton, and it's a major center for high-tech R&D. NCR started out in the late 1800s as the National Cash Register Company. AT&T bought it in 1991 in an attempt to get into the PC business, but then sold it off again in 1996. Today, NCR no longer makes PCs, but it has become the world's leading vendor of ATMs, and it is working now to push that technology in several new directions. This is a model of a new web-enabled ATM that will let you do web surfing while you're doing your banking transactions. You can book airline reservations at this ATM, or check on sports scores, or the local weather. NCR is also working on new web terminals that would go into kitchen appliances, like a refrigerator or a microwave oven. NCR thinks the kitchen is the ultimate location for internet home appliances. Another research project that we're looking at is called the microwave bank, which obviously hooks up to the internet so that you can uh, microwave your food while conducting uh, bank transactions at the same time. And what we're doing with that is to study how in the future folks will be conducting transactions, not just outside of their homes, but inside their homes as well, too. For example, I think earlier folks were thinking, gee, it's going to be all in the den with, you know, with your television set and interactive. But some studies have shown that people are spending a lot, a lot of time in the kitchen. The kitchen is kind of the heart of the home. That's where you sit down and pay bills, or that's where people congregate. So we were really kind of focusing on those areas where people are spending a lot of time. NCR has targeted the supermarket as one environment for the growth of ATM-style automation. This is their new automated checkout station. No need to wait in line for a clerk. Scan the products yourself and go on your way. The challenge here is to design a system in which you can't cheat. NCR solved that problem by turning this bagging platform into a scale. The supermarket's database knows exactly what each item should weigh. It correlates the items scanned with the total weight in your bag. If they don't match, you'll get stuffed. Another NCR innovation is new technology to do away with PIN numbers at ATMs. This new ATM scans the iris of your eye to identify you. In fact, iris patterns are far more unique than even fingerprints and provide a much more secure transaction than by just using a PIN. Despite today's high demand for engineers and programmers and the big money lure of Silicon Valley jobs, NCR says it has no problem finding employees to work in the Dayton area. Some folks ask us, gee, is it hard to recruit people out to the Midwest, you know, and the cornfields and that type of thing? And we're actually finding that, that people are enjoying coming out here because the cost of living is so much cheaper. You can actually get places within 10 or 15 minutes. And it's a very family-friendly uh, atmosphere. So, uh, believe it or not, we're really not having problems attracting people out here, even though it's not the Silicon Valley. Besides NCR, Dayton is also the home of LexisNexis, the world's largest online publisher. The LexisNexis database contains over 70 terabytes of information, more than 2.5 billion documents. LexisNexis started the online research business more than 30 years ago before anybody had ever heard of the Internet or the World Wide Web. They originally used a proprietary network. But they are now evolving into a web-based product, currently running 70 different URLs. Indeed, LexisNexis sees itself as the original e-commerce company. In fact, we like to believe that we were in e-commerce before e-commerce was coined as a phrase. We, were, we are delivering uh, up to, on our peak day, we do a million searches. So we're taking a million orders, we're delivering a million answer sets, and we're cutting a million invoice records in one day. And that's e-commerce. LexisNexis is facing a totally new competitive environment in the Internet era. While well, they see themselves as a pioneer, others see them as a dinosaur. And that has had a negative effect on the perception of LexisNexis in the investment market. I think in terms of the pure revenue flows, 
um, you've, you've got to take uh, separate views as to what's the reality versus what the market thinks. Um, the reality is that um, the, the web has come in and said it's, uh, it's got everything. Uh, the, real, the, the, the real truth of the matter is that um, we are actually still adding value in LexisNexis. Um, the, uh, the revenue flows are still very healthy and we're still a very profitable company and we have made that jump to Lexis.com, uh, Universe Product, Science Direct in, in a very healthy way such that we're now right there as the dot-com company. Well, the Pentagon may be in Washington, D.C., but out here in the middle of Ohio, the Department of Defense has one of the biggest computing centers you'll ever see. In fact, this is the major R&D lab for the U.S. Air Force, where they test and simulate new weapon systems. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, named after the aviation pioneers and the founder of NCR, is located just a stone's throw from the airfield where Wilbur and Orville first experimented with heavier-than-air flight. While they went to Kitty Hawk, North Carolina to do their first experimental flight, they actually designed the first airplane here in Dayton. The Wright brothers started out in the bicycle business, running this little bicycle shop, which still stands in downtown Dayton. And here at the U.S. Air Force Museum, you can see the actual 1906 U.S. patent for what was then called the flying machine. In less than 100 years, the art of flying has changed quite a bit. This is the Science Visualization Lab at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Using this high-powered, big-screen simulator, new fighter jets are tested in virtual wind tunnels. The operator uses a 3D headset, and a 3D wand, each with motion sensors, to navigate the plane through a variety of flight environments, testing the stresses and structural integrity of the aircraft. The computing center here at the Air Force Base is massive. Using computers from IBM, Sun, Compaq, and SGI, they have computing power of over 600 gigaflops and data storage of more than 600 terabytes. Usually we try to compare ourselves to how many millions of of uh, Intel Pentiums we have. That's sort of a moving target, but about a year ago we, we usually advertised we had the capability of two and a half million uh, Pentium, Intel Pentium processors. Uh, that's a lot of compute power if you, if you know how powerful those things are on people's desktops now. The computing facility here at the Aeronautical Systems Center is used to solve a variety of Defense Department problems. Being an Army, Navy, and Air Force program, we're trying to solve problems that may uh, range from a, uh, a, a tanker carrying fuel and, and having to swerve back and forth when does the thing tip over, an aircraft that's flying through the air, the wing goes through a flutter situation, how much uh, of that flutter can take place and you can still maintain the structural integrity of that system. Here in the simulation and analysis facility called SIMAP for short, programmers are porting older Unix-based mainframe applications to Linux-based PCs. The primary reason that we're looking at using Linux in the PC world is just because the PCs obviously are getting cheaper, faster, much, you know, much faster for the money. And in Linux in particular, Linux is essentially free. Um, so there is no, it reduces all of our operations and maintenance costs associated with that platform over the more expensive platforms. The simulation and analysis facility develops software to enable pilots to do mission rehearsals in realistic flight simulators. Using this virtual battlefield management system, pilots can become familiar with the terrain and take the time to think about the tactics they'll have to use in real time once they go out on the actual mission. The programmers here like using Linux for their simulators because of the worldwide support that's available. It's open source. Um, when there is a problem, things do seem to get solved very quickly. It's kind of a double-edged sword because nobody is in, partic in charge. Um, but I found that in the Linux community, if I have a problem or a question, I'm, in fact, a very detailed question, a programming question, if I post it to one of the news groups, I usually get answers within hours. And I might not just get one, I might get ten. So um, from that point of view, it's, it's nice. The other thing is, is if you do have a problem and something isn't working quite right, the author knows about the problem because they see it being raised in the news groups and, and the problem is solved quickly. 
While you may not think these simulations look as good as the little flight simulator program you run on your PC, there is a reason. The really good stuff is classified. What you're looking at here, first off, what you're looking at is not our most current generation of graphics. Um, we have things that will knock your socks off um, that we're not going to show you. <laughs> but what's, what is important to realize is what you see visually on the screen might be more attractive out of a $39 game. What's going on behind that thing, to doing the calculations, to giving you the real, to really modeling the aircraft very realistically, is these are far superior. They have what we call much higher resolution or higher fidelity. And, um, and of course, then these programs, these models are all designed so that aerospace engineers can change the characteristics very easily. And we have more detail than I will talk to you about on that. This is Mendelssohn's liquidation outlet store here in Dayton. It is a mecca for any geek who lives here in the Midwest. In fact, it is the country's biggest electronics warehouse store with floor space equivalent to nine square blocks, all of it devoted to computers and electronics. They have over 400,000 items in their inventory, from computer peripherals to every kind of electronic component you could think of. It is the physical version of eBay, all here in one place. What we do here is it's on site. You can feel and touch it. We have put stuff on eBay and everything, and we have not had great success because uh, it's, it's, our stuff is different. You have to really look at it and feel and touch it and, and know what you want. And uh, we are on the uh, World Wide Web, uh, MECI.com, uh, and we are getting good success at it. But when someone comes here, we get the glow. I mean, they give us that glow from their eyes. First thing they say is, wow, where'd you get all this stuff? Walking around Mendelssohn's is like touring an electronics museum. Owner Sandy Mendelssohn says it's more than just a store, it's an attitude, respect for the old-fashioned art of building things. We need to groom our youth to realize they have to use their hands and their brains to come up with the next widgets to make old men like us uh, our lives easier. Uh, a lot of people today are the dot-com, go to work for companies and don't understand we need to have uh, R&D, research and development, engineers uh, inventing things. Another place to revel in the high-tech past is the Computer Museum exhibit at Computer Fest. It's run by Gary Ganger. It's his private collection, including almost every key machine in the PC revolution. Gary used to head up the local Timex Sinclair users group. And he has this incredible collection of every Sinclair computer and their clones. This is the original portable computer, the luggable Osborne, running CPM and weighing about 40 pounds. He has an amazing collection of portables, including the grid, the original IBM laptop, the NEC, the Amstrad, and the first color portable from Commodore. And of course, no collection would be complete without the MITS Altair 680, the original computer kit, complete with 256 bytes, not kilobytes, 256 bytes of memory. But while looking at the old stuff is fun, most people here at Computer Fest come to buy the new stuff at bargain prices. Well, I bought a new hard drive. I got one in mine now, and I need to put another one in it. Because if one of them messes up, I can switch over to the other one. Oh, well, right now I'm looking for a for a, um, an ATX case, um, looking for a good 3D uh, um, um, video card and a 3D sound card, Ma basically gaming. We come here twice a year, they have the computer show. We come every time they have it. And what do you come looking for? Uh, well, computer parts, software, hardware, paper, ink, everything. Anything you bought so far? I bought ink so far. <laughs> yeah, I come down from Milwaukee for this. Wow. Yeah, I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'll be leaving after the show today to make my drive back then. How far a drive is it? Uh, about four hours, I'm sorry, seven hours, 400 miles. All right, so you drive seven hours to come shop here. Oh, sure. Explain that. The, the prices, it's a great deal. This is like the biggest one in the Midwest. We bought motherboard, we bought CPUs, we bought um, sound cards, uh, we bought a CDRW, everything. 
In addition to picking up bargains and hard-to-find items like software and PC components, there are some new local technologies on display here at Computer Fest. A company called VirtualPCShow.com is trying to turn this event into a virtual computer mark. It's a 24 by 7 online marketplace for computer products. This is a beta version of their site, due up in a few months. The advantages of the virtual show are, of course, it's open year-round, and you can shop from home. What's unique about this site is that it's live. You can bargain real-time with the vendors in a product chat room. This is a unique peripheral for the Palm Pilot from a local Dayton company called Monarch Paxar. Just slip your pilot into the printer, and you have an instant portable point-of-sale terminal that spits out receipts. 8.59, you call. The Dayton Police Department has been one of the country's leaders in putting laptop computers in their patrol cars. This is a Motorola Pentium PC connected to the police department's NT server via a radio network. Officer Timothy Canelli says using the computer rather than the old-fashioned police radio means he can get information ten times faster. And perhaps the best and most timely new idea at Computer Fest was a new website called GasPriceWatch.com. It's the creation of a local group of techies here in Dayton who want to use the Internet to bring some market sanity to gasoline prices. Gas Price Watch is a consumer advocacy site that we're set up to, uh, to really help consumers make an educated purchasing decision. Uh, gives local gas prices to all the gas stations across the United States and uh, lets consumers log in, search their local area, search around their work, search where they're going on vacation, and find the cheapest gas in that area. GasPriceWatch.com now has 55,000 gas stations in their database, and they're recruiting an army of civilian spotters to input local gas prices onto their website. Their goal, to save consumers at least a billion dollars in gasoline costs. In 1999, in the United States, 118 billion gallons of gasoline were sold to consumers. Um, if we could save everyone just one cent a gallon, I mean, we're talking over a billion dollars back into the economy. And, you know, through a simple site like this, enlisting the help of the local consumers to spot prices for us, we think we can make it happen. That's it for this special edition of the Computer Chronicles. Thanks for joining us here along the banks of the Miami River. It's somehow comforting to know that even if you live in the Ohio Valley rather than the Silicon Valley, you can still find lots of high-tech innovation. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Stuart Chaffe in Dayton, Ohio. The Computer Chronicles is brought to you by rondiamond.com, the oldies site on the internet. Music and memories from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, not just another jukebox. Additional support comes from the law offices of Ivan Hoffman, lawyering with integrity for internet law, copyright, trademark, and other intellectual property law. And by TechWeb for up-to-the-minute technology news. To purchase a videotape copy of today's program, call toll-free 1-888-888. 310-7850. Please specify the show number and the topic.